This is C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Next, oral argument on the constitutionality of the no-fly list. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard Ibrahim versus the Department of Homeland Security last month in San Francisco. In 2005, Rahina Ibrahim was a doctoral candidate at Stanford University when she was not allowed on a plane to her home of Malaysia after being told she was on the no-fly list. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Marwa Elzenkali. I'm uh, from McManus, Faulkner & Morgan. And uh, with me is Christine Peek, uh, also from our office, and we represent the appellant, Rahina Ibrahim. Um, I think that uh, given our limited amount of time, there are a lot of issues that were briefed in this appeal. Um, there are three issues that I would like to, uh, to address and, of course, answer any questions that the court might have. Um, the issues are, first of all, the issue of whether or not the district court has subject matter jurisdiction to hear our claims um, challenging the placement of our client's um, name on the no-fly list. Um, and actually specifically on the government's watch list by the uh, terrorist screening center. Uh, the other issue that I'd like to discuss is the issue of our Section 1983 claim against the federal government based on the um, unlawful and unauthorized arrest of uh, my client, Rahina Ibrahim. And finally, I'd also like to talk about the issue of uh, whether or not the court has personal jurisdiction over Mr. John Bondanella, who was a private contractor working for the federal government at the time of her arrest, who uh, directed that Ms. Ibrahim be arrested, uh, even though that was not authorized by the no-fly list, as the federal government has conceded. Um, so first of all, with respect to the issue of subject matter jurisdiction, we have argued that the district court has subject matter jurisdiction to hear our challenge to the terrorist screening center's placement of our client's name in their database. The terrorist screening center is a completely separate entity from the um, Transportation Security Administration. It is not subject to the uh, jurisdictional statute that is uh, Section 49 U.S.C. 46110, which covers the uh, Under Secretary of Transportation for Security and uh, the TSA and uh, prevents or requires that any challenge to an order of the TSA must be heard by a United, Sto United States Court of Appeals. The Terrorist Screening Center is not part of that um, agency and is not subject to that, to that statute. You, you're bringing essentially an APA claim uh, against final agency action, right? Yes, you are. Yeah. And the agency involved is the, this um, uh, terror screening. Um, terror screening center, yes. Which is under the supervision, of, as I understand, under the supervision of the FBI. It is correct. So it's located somewhere in the Department of Justice or something. It's it's sorry. under the Department of Justice. The the TSA is under the um, Department of Homeland Security. Now you you should should. Mr. Chertoff, right? Yes, we did, Your Honor. Uh, is he the right defendant? I mean, who else have you sued here? Uh, Mr. Chertoff at the time was the head of the, um, the, the DHS, I believe. Right, but, but the, the, the center, as you told me, is injustice, which is a different... We sued a number of federal, federal um, agencies. We sued the TSA, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, and the Terrorist Screening Center, and the FBI. We basically sued anyone who was involved or could have been involved in um, Ms. Ibrahim's arrest and in her pla the, the placement of her name on the no-fly list. Uh, essentially, and, and your APA claim is simply to try to get her name off the no-fly list. Correct. That, that's the only relief you seek under the APA. It's, it's to take her name off of a government watch list. It's the same list that is being used, that, that, is, that is basically put together by the TSC and is used by every government agency who engages in any terrorist um, uh, monitoring activities, including the TSA, but in also including um, uh, overseas consulates in issuing visas, um, including lo local uh, law enforcement agencies and state law enforcement agencies. Uh, and and that, that list is distributed to many different agencies. It's not just used by the TSA, and it is not the TSA that decides whose name gets placed on that list. And in fact, we submitted uh, a memorandum that was, that was filed by the TSA in another action, uh, Gray versus TSA, where the TSA says it is not um, the TSA that, um, 
and it's not the TSA but another agency within the government that makes the determination that an individual poses. I do understand all that. The relief you're seeking is to have your client's name removed from this list. I call it a no-fly list, but as you pointed out, it's broader than that. But there is a list which has a consequence of making it difficult to fly, but it also makes it difficult to do other things, right? Correct. And you don't want her name off that list. Correct. Okay. Now, and that's the only relief you're seeking under the APA. You've got other relief for damages under some other theories, but that's the only relief you're seeking under the Administrative Procedure Act. We are seeking specific relief as to her, but we are also seeking broad constitutional challenges to the way that that list is being prepared. Basically, that people's names are being put on there without any notice, without any hearing or an opportunity to contest their name being placed on there. And then once they find out that, you know. Is this a class action? No, it is not, Your Honor. And does your client have standing to raise? I mean, I can see sort of saying, I want my name removed from the list. Does she have standing to make broader claims about how the list is put together? We believe that she does because she was injured by the way the list is being put together. So she has suffered an injury in fact. Now, because your time is short, let me just ask a couple more questions, because I just want to make all this clear on the, you know, your client is now not in the United States. No, she is not. And she doesn't have a visa to come to the United States. No, she does not. And you're not challenging the absence of a visa in this lawsuit? We are, what we are saying is that the revocation of her visa resulted from the placement of her name in the TSC's database. I see. So you're claiming an injury to her in addition to not being able to fly, that her name being on the list also is depriving her of the opportunity to come to the United States or the chance to get a visa. Correct. Okay, so that takes care of my next question, which would have been the question of continuing injury. There is a continuing injury under your theory, and I'm just hurrying along because we've got a lot of ground to cover. There's a continuing injury because so long as her name stays on that list, she's not likely to get a visa, and so she's not likely to be able to return to the United States. Did she ever finish her education here? She did, Your Honor. She did submit her thesis from overseas to Stanford, and she now has her Ph.D. from Stanford. But she might want to come here for other reasons. Correct. She's still continuing to work with Stanford. Okay. That's fine. Again, I don't mean to cut you off, but I just wanted to clarify in my mind those questions. Now, on your claim for prospective relief, you bring a 1983 claim against the federal government. Yes. That's a very strange claim to bring. The 1983 doesn't apply to the federal government. Well, Your Honor, it applies if the federal government acted in concert with or in conspiracy with the state government under color of state law. Now, our theory here is that it was under color of state law, first of all, because the no-fly list does not authorize the arrest of an individual. It only says, the security directives, that is, only require that if someone's name is found on the no-fly list that they not be allowed to fly. It does not say that they be arrested. And the federal government conceded that point during the course of the briefing and hearing on the motions to dismiss. So the arrest was completely outside of federal law and, therefore, was under color of state law. But the federal government worked with the San Francisco Police Department in carrying out that arrest. They were constantly in contact. It usually works the other way, where federal agents or state agents can be deputized to perform, act under color of federal authority because they act, for example, under a task force. You'll have federal agents, I'm sorry, local or state police cooperate with federal agents, and you might then have a Bivens claim against the state agents because, although they're exercising state authority, they might also be exercising federal authority. I've never heard of a case going the other way where the fact that the United States acts through, and we have to accept your case as you plead it, as I understand the cases, you had a federal agent, somebody who had the color of federal authority at least, and he tells the local police, arrest or detain this person, right? Right. And so they 
essentially they, they don't see any violation of local law. There's nothing going on. You know, this person not, is not violating local law. They are, they are arresting as, as, a, as an accommodation uh, to the federal authorities, essentially performing a federal function. I, I don't see where that can possibly be viewed as a, as a federal government acting under the color of state law. Well, because uh, the reason we, we, we say that is because there, there is no federal authority allowing, allowing her to be arrested by being on the no-fly list. And so it's, it's the way that we interpreted it is that this, the um, local police were arresting her under their authority under state law to, to carry out an arrest. And they did that with the federal government. The, the, as I understand your theory, you, theoret you can theoretically pursue a 1983 claim against a, a federal uh, official if the federal f official is transformed into a state actor, and, and that doesn't seem to fit here. It, it was the it was the, um, the the federal authorities who were who caused whatever happened to your client. To the, the case law, from what I understand, um, and specifically, I believe the case is Cabrera, which says that. If the federal government works in concert with the um, s uh, s uh, local authorities or the state government, then you can have a Section 1983 claim. Let me ask you a question backing up to what my good colleague, the Chief, has talked to you about. I read your first amended complaint. Your mm -hmm. first amended complaint says that you challenged the TSA's implementation of the no-fly list. No place in the amended complaint does it say you bring a claim challenging the TSC's decision to pace her on the screening list. If you didn't bring it in the district court, why are we having it? We actually did, Your Honor. We did name the TSC, and we did talk about the TSC, and we did explain that the TSC is the um, agency that makes the decision as to whose name is on the no-fly list. Well, but your complaint just says it was the implementation of the no-fly list that's the problem. Well, our, well, we actually do challenge the placement of her name on the no-fly list. In the complaint? In, in the Where? complaint. You might look at that. On, I look on very hard at that. On paragraph 60, um, we say on information of the and, and belief the placement I'm of names sorry, on the no-fly list. Uh, 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 where are you reading from? I, I apologize. Um, it's page 0211 in the uh, record. We say the no-fly list and the placement of Ibrahim. This is, I'm sorry, this is paragraph 60 of our amended complaint. 0211. So, uh, this is the complaint, right? Second cause of action. This is the amended complaint, yes. Okay, and you're looking at paragraph what? Paragraph 60. It says the no-fly list and the placement of Ibrahim on this list is unconstitutional. Uh, and then the second sentence says, on information of belief, the placement of names on the no-fly list is done in an arbitrary and capricious manner and without any factual findings or rational basis. Well, that's why I thought it was the implementation of the no-fly list. It's exactly that, arbitrary and capricious. Now, you had a third claim uh, as to Mr. Um, Bondanella. B, yes, Bondanella. Yeah. Uh, and why don't you go ahead and discuss that? Sure. Um, we, we brought a claim, um, we included Mr. Bondanella as a defendant in this action. Um, the court dismissed our claims against him based on lack of personal jurisdiction, although the court did note that we probably would have a Section 1983 claim against Mr. Bondanella if, he, um, if the court had jurisdiction over him. We disagree with the court's uh, opinion uh, because basically, um, th I mean, there are a lot of elements that go towards finding personal jurisdiction, but our uh, argument... What, what claim are you bringing against Mr. Bondanella? Which cause, which cause what of What substantive claim? We, we have a number of uh, state law claims, uh, false arrest, uh, unlawful okay, prison, that sort of thing. We also have a Section 1983 claim against Mr. Bondanella. Okay. For the unlawful arrest for violation uh, of her Fourth Amendment right. How can right? we, on the state law claims, how can you sue a federal agent for state tort claims? 
He actually is not a federal agent. He was a private contractor. He was working on behalf of the federal government, but he was a private contractor working for a private employer at the time that he, um, that, that he uh, directed the arrest. And so we are suing him in his individual capacity. Well, yes, but, but he is exercising the power of the federal government. Uh, he is a contractor. I mean, he's uh, just, just take it, sure. take, take it uh, for granted for the purpose of the question that he is, in fact, a federal agent. You can't sue federal agents or federal employees, at least, uh, for uh, state torts, right? I mean, other, can, otherwise, they, well, you can sue them I, if I think you, that goes back to McCullough's smell, doesn't it? Right. Well, you can sue them if you make a claim under the FTCA. You can sue the United States under the FTCA, but you neglected to file a, a, uh, a administrative claim uh, within the time allowed of the FTCA. And, and that, and that you, is... You can't sue individual agents because, I mean, if you sue the mailman for running over your dog mm -hmm. and he has to spend time... No, no, I mean... Right. Mailmen do run over dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, your remedy in that case is that you sue the United States for the loss of the dog under the F FTCA, and you make an administrative claim, but you don't tie up the mailman because he, you know, uh, he ran over your dog or you know whatever. Uh, otherwise, the government, federal government, would grind to a halt if 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 uh, federal uh, agents could be sued in state court for state tort claims. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're agreed on that, basically, aren't we? Right. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean you, but, but so I, I don't see how, how you can, pro uh, I mean, your only way of suing him, Mr. Badanella, for state tort suit would be to say he's not a federal agent. And that, well, that's, no, that's, and actually we do say that he is a federal agent because we say that in support of our Section 1983 claim well, against the, the federal once government. Once he's a federal agent, because he was see, acting on, see, on it seems behalf. to me the, the state tort claims uh, are preempted. It, it, unless you file a claim under the FTCA, which, which is another issue that was briefed here, uh, whether or not our claim was timely. We've argued that, that it was timely because the court can grant us leave to amend our complaint and allege that we have filed uh, our FTCA claims and that the, the, the time for the, the federal government to um, deny you, you the claims has run. Seek, and you didn't seek a stay. Is I'm sorry? The problem is you didn't seek a stay of the litigation while the... You didn't seek a stay. We did not seek a stay. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Do you want to um, save the rest of your time? Unless, uh, yes, Your Honor, to, for rebuttal. Was there any questions? We'll hear from the other side. Thank you. Who's going to speak first? May it please the court. Uh, my name is Joshua Waldman. I'm here from the Department of Justice representing the federal appellees. By this court's order, I have 10 of the 20 minutes, and my uh, uh, co-counsel will take five each uh, afterwards. Um, if I could, I'd like to start on the uh, jurisdictional question under Section 46110. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much dispute that insofar as a uh, security directive implementing the no-fly list issued by the Transportation Security Agency uh, is at stake here, that's an order within the meaning of 46110. And this court's uh, precedent in Gilmore versus Gonzalez is directly on point in that issue. But, but what they're, uh, I understand, really complaining about is not the fact that she wasn't allowed to fly, mm -hmm. but the fact that she has her name on a list, which is causing her all sorts of grief of being uh, not allowed to fly, being worn in manifestation, being denied a visa to the United States, being another. Uh, how does she challenge that in, your, in the view of the United States? Well, I, I think that there are, uh, there's two separate issues there. If you have a challenge about your visa uh, not being issued, which, by the way, isn't mentioned in the complaint, uh, but if it were, I think you bring an action against the State Department, who is also well, not a, not but, a named but defendant. But the claim is that the, the, there's a whole series of things, of disabilities that she suffers, as a result of being included in the list. The denial of a visa makes us an act of injury because if you didn't have this visa claim, we might say, well, look, you're in 
Malaysia? Uh, is she living in Malaysia now? I mean, but any event, she's outside the United States right now. Mm -hmm. And so whatever our government, whatever lists our government puts her on is of no harm to her because she's not here. But then she has a live claim because she says, look, well, the reason I'm not here, or one of the reasons I'm not here, is that uh, my name is on this very list, which I'm challenging. So I have a continuing injury, so there's no problem with standing. Uh, or concreteness of injury or anything of that sort. And she says, what I'm claiming is not I'm not being allowed to fly or I'm not given a visa. What I am challenging is the fact that my name is on this blacklist and that grievous injury happens to me and people like me who get put on this list. Uh, is, is this, a, is this a claim that for which there is a judicial remedy in the views of the United States? Uh, yes, Your Honor, but I think it's important to understand okay. how yeah, these... Yeah, yeah, yes is fine. Okay. Uh, yes is fine. And so let me ask my next question. Uh, if not here, where? And if not now, when? Uh, well, I think it's important in answering that question to explain a little bit how the list works. That's from the Talmud, you know. Excuse me? That's from the Talmud, you know. Uh, uh, That's a question from the Talmud. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm very bright. Well, I, I won't try to answer it in the cosmic sense, but in the in the context well, I, of this case. I mean, uh, I, I mean, this this seems like a highly concrete case. Uh, seems like a highly palpable injury. It, it does seem injurious. I mean, if your name or my name or anybody's name in this courtroom uh, were put on that list, we would suffer grievously, and uh, we want to have some way of going to our government uh, and possibly to our courts. And saying, look, I'm, I shouldn't be on that list. I, I'm an ordinary person who doesn't deserve to be, uh, to be put on the list. How, how do you, what well, do they do? Well, I think in answering the question, it's important to understand how the lists operate. Because as Your, Your Honor said, an injury occurs. But the injury occurs, uh, if there is an injury, at the time that the TSA makes a decision, or in the case of a visa, at the time that the State Department uh, makes a decision, and it's no injury occurs uh, by virtue of a decision made by the Terrorist Screening Center, the TSC, who maintains a list, which is then used by a different agency, the TSA, who, by the way, I think it's important to recognize, can put other names on the no-fly list, even if they're not on the TSC's list, and the TSC may have names on its overarching list that don't necessarily get put on the no-fly list. It's an independent decision by TSA. And if your argument is, or your claim is, I'm injured because I'm on the no-fly list, that's a decision by TSA, not by TSC. Uh, now, there are often instances, uh, and this happens all the time in the federal government, where one agency or a cabinet officer consults with and may even rely on information from another. There are many statutes that okay. ask the, a, the attorney general Let to consult with the what, what does this... I mean, there is this agency, mm -hmm. which is supervised by the FBI, yes. and it maintains a list. That's correct. Okay. And it, they don't just do it for their health, right? They don't just do it because they like to keep lists. That's right. This isn't one of those internet things where, you know, list mania, right? No, it's not like that. Uh, they, they, they do it. They are paid federal salaries, and they're given access to federal computers and other resources to maintain a list with a particular purpose that serves the United States. And that purpose, as I understand it, uh, has to do with maintaining the safety uh, of, of the United States uh, by denying certain access to certain benefits and certain uh, uh, modes of transportation and the like to people who are thought to be dangerous. You, you're nodding, but the record doesn't show. Oh, it doesn't, yes. It doesn't, doesn't reflect nods. Yes. Yes. So, so uh, um, they say, look, we, we, uh, it is obviously a, a serious injury to somebody who's put on that list, even before it actually gets implemented, because every time you do something in your life, you might bump up against some activity that you will be barred from, from undertaking, and you won't find out about it until you're about to board that plane or, or you know, do whatever these, uh, or try to get a visa, and you bump up against it. So instead of going to New York, you wind up staying in San Francisco because they said, no, so you can't fly. Uh, are you saying that just being put on the list is not a sufficiently concrete injury uh, to, to give standing? What, what exactly is, is, is your argument? 
That is my argument, Your Honor. I think the judge... And let's say we disagree with you on that. I do understand the argument. I'm not saying we do disagree. But let's say we were to disagree with you on that. What method... So let's say we think there is a concrete enough injury by being put on the list. What method is there for getting one's name off the list? There is a procedure that TSA has. It's now called the TRIP program. I can't remember off the top of my head what the acronym is for. But you can... It's not that I don't want to fly. I don't want to have this FBI-like agency have my name on the list. You're talking about TSC, Your Honor? TSC. That's the one I'm talking about. And you say, I'm not sure flying is the only thing I want to do. What I want is my name off that list. So all the things that all the agencies, all the places that use TSC lists to keep me from participating in activities, they will have a... They will no longer have a reason to keep me from participating for the many things that you cannot do so long as your name is on that list. Is there a method for removing oneself from that list? As far as I know, there's no administrative mechanism in the same way that TSA has an administrative mechanism for getting your name off the no-fly list. So they've brought a APA action saying this is final agency action. The final agency action is this agency, TSC, which is an agency, yes? Yes, it is. You don't dispute that it's an agency? I'm not disputing that. Okay. And you're not disputing it's final agency action, are you? No, we haven't briefed that at all. We haven't argued that at all. That was not an issue. Is that a no? That's a... You know, we have neither conceded that nor addressed it in the district court. I'm asking you a question. Does the United States have a position as to whether or not this is final agency action? If you say the United States doesn't have a position, that's fine. I don't... We'll have to decide on our own. Your Honor, I don't know the answer to that. I don't have a position on that. But if you think this is an important... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sure. I mean... I thought if you think this is an important issue, you can order us to have a supplemental briefing on this question. We'd be happy to do that. Perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, they bring an APA action. They have to have a final agency action. Assume it's final agency action. Why is this the kind of thing that the district court should take jurisdiction over and consider whether or not the name was properly placed on the list, on the TSC list? Well, I think if we assume that it's an agency and there's final agency action, I think that there would be APA jurisdiction. It wouldn't fall under 46110 because 46110 covers TSA, not TSC. We don't dispute that notion. What are... You know, I did not have any difficulty understanding from their briefs that that's what they were arguing. And I, talking to counsel, I think I was right. I think... Now, you chose not to respond to that argument. Why should I give you another chance to respond to it? Well, our response was that the challenge that they are making, in our view, is an injury about not being able to fly. And if you look at the complaint, all of the factual allegations, all the discussion in the complaint is about an incident at the San Francisco airport where she was not able to board a plane and not able to fly. And as we view that, that's all about the no-fly list. It's not an abstract question about putting it on a list. It's about an injury that occurred as a result of an order from the TSA, not from the TSA. Well, I read the brief somewhat differently, so I guess perhaps we'll read them differently. But assuming that the question really is they want APA review of the TSC, inclusion of the TSC list, you don't have a reason why this shouldn't go forward, do you? Well, the only reason I would say at this point is I don't read their complaint as bringing anything under the APA. There's no mention of sort of what the standard review is, whether it would be arbitrary, capricious, substantial evidence. The only thing I see are six claims under 1983 and six claims under state tort law. So I understand you say, you know, so our argument was the only thing that they're injured by is the TSA order, and that's under 46110, not in the district. You shouldn't bring that in the district court. You know, if they had had a different, we might have argued the case a little bit differently. But, you know, I think in your complaint, you have to give a little bit of a fair notice about what you're arguing and not sort of point to is it implementing, is it placement, and, you know, we're really starting to parse the fine language here, you know, and you start, you know, especially when we're getting into questions of, you know, they have Bivens claims that aren't actually 
set forth in the complaint. There was no exhaustion. FTCA isn't even mentioned in the complaint. There's all sorts of deficiencies. I think it would be fair to the government to say, you know, if you're going to bring this kind of, you've got to be a little bit clear about what you're doing. And, Your Honors, I don't want to be fair to, I want to be fair to my co-counsel. We're now down to about eight minutes. If you wanted to, I'd be happy to answer any other questions if you wanted to. I don't want to take out of their time, but if you wanted to grant additional time, I'd be happy to do that. Otherwise, I'd be. We'll hear from co-counsel. Thank you. May it please the Court, Sharon Mayo on behalf of Defendant and Appellee John Bondanella. I came to address the district court's dismissal of Mr. Bondanella on personal jurisdiction grounds, which I think were absolutely proper. The court mentioned this morning another reason why Mr. Bondanella should not be sued in this case, and because the court can affirm a district court's dismissal on any proper ground that's in the record, I will leave that to your. Well, that applies to the state tort claims. I'm not sure it applies to the 1983 claims. I mean, he gets a call from the police here, and the police say, I mean, he tells them, arrest. Did he say arrest? No, he did not, Your Honor, and that is one factual issue. He said detain. Yes, he said specifically the allegation is that Officer Pate called Mr. Bondanella seeking confirmation that the plaintiff was on the no-fly list, that Mr. Bondanella told Officer Pate to not allow plaintiff on the flight, to contact the FBI, and to detain her for questioning. The facts and the allegations of the complaint also make clear the timing of these events. She alleges that she, after Officer Pate made this phone call, she was left standing at the ticket counter for a substantial period of time during which she was in pain. So I think that, combined with the specific allegation of the complaint that Mr. Bondanella simply said to detain her, that was not an order for her arrest, and I think it's an overstatement of plaintiff's allegations to say that Mr. Bondanella ordered her arrest. I think the facts do not bear that out. As far as the personal jurisdiction issue goes, there were two arguments that I wanted to focus on. One is that under the effects test for under the Calder v. Jones case, Mr. Bondanella's conduct was not expressly aimed at the forum state. The Calder case and the Ninth Circuit cases that have followed it recognize that it's not simply enough to have foreseeable effects in the forum. There must be something more, and that something more is individual targeting of the plaintiff. Now, the facts of this case are that Mr. Bondanella received a phone call from Officer Pate. Clearly, he had, there's no allegation, and I think no allegation that could be made, that he knew that Ms. Ibrahim was going to fly that day, that he knew that he was going to receive a phone call from Officer Pate asking him what to do, that he even knew who Ms. Ibrahim was. All he was doing was doing his job. He was simply answering the phone and responding to an inquiry from a law enforcement officer who could have been calling from any jurisdiction. And if Bondanella had instructed Officer Pate to arrest, to make an arrest, is that sufficient? No, I don't think so, Your Honor, because there still is no allegation that he individually targeted that plaintiff. If you look at the cases that talk about individually targeting the plaintiff in the forum, there are cases where there is some course of conduct. For example, the Ziegler case, which the plaintiff relies heavily on, involved a course of dealing between a California distributor of fruit products and a Florida grower. And the distributor sent a check to the grower and then subsequently filed for bankruptcy 
and that check was dishonored. The Florida grower first wrote a letter to, to the distributor and said, pay up on the check or I'm gonna go to the authorities and have you arrested because that's a crime. He then enlisted, the grower then enlisted the Florida um, sheriff and sergeant to send similar letters to, or send a similar letter to the um, uh, uh, distributor in California and followed that up with more affirmative conduct. They subpoenaed bank records in California. You know, you can pass this pretty, pretty finely, but in the end, he tells local police, detain her. I mean, I don't know how you can have a more direct targeted effect than talking to an officer uh, in a local authority, somebody you know has a badge and a gun and handcuffs, and tell them, uh, exercise your authority as a peace officer in your local jurisdiction uh, to uh, keep this person from leaving. I, you know, you can talk about these other cases, but they don't seem to be at all analogous. Well, I think in... Uh, I mean, this is not an accident. He didn't sort of, uh, he didn't just uh, call, uh, uh, you know, sort of an APB and he didn't know what, to, you know, he knew who he was talking to. He was talking to somebody who was a police officer in San Francisco with authority uh, to, to, to arrest, uh, to detain, uh, to shoot and kill if need be. Uh, and, uh, well, and he says, don't let her go until you've got cleared by the FBI, which is exactly what he did. Well, the cases make clear that the, the defendant has to be targeting, individually targeting the forum and the plaintiff. And here, that's the element that's not met. There's no showing this is that. Be, this is because the call came to him and he didn't call them? And, and he had n no knowledge of, of who this person was other than to you know, look at the no-fly list and see that her name is on it. Um, this isn't something that was motivated by any well, animus. What if, what, what if you got in a call and they say, hey, uh, you know, uh, we do contract killings in California and you hear we have some enemies here, we'll take care of them for you. He says, okay, great. I'll pay you 10 grand if you take out Mr. X. Uh, I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, I mean, what he's doing is, I mean, no matter who made the initial phone call, the point is he knows that once he says the word, he's speaking on behalf of the United States uh, in a you know environment like uh, the airport uh, when he's speaking on behalf of the TSA. If he tells state authorities, don't let this person go until uh, you talk to the FBI, they're not going to let, you know, they're going to use whatever authority and power uh, and violence and forces available to them and necessary to affect this uh, to keep her from leaving. There's no doubt about it. And I, well, that, I don't know how you can say that's not targeted. It's just sort of a random act. Well, that happened, would... It happened, you know, I, I threw an order and it fell to the ground I know not where. Well, that would, that would place Mr. Bondanella and uh, other watch officers in the Transporta Transportation Security Operations Center and, frankly, uh, employees in any other federal agency at jeopardy of being sued in any jurisdiction simply because well, they get a phone call the, the answer, that happens the, to come the, from somewhere else. The answer, else. of course, is that they have immunity if their lawyers raise the issue. Well, we're, uh, we're not if, if, if you raise the issue of immunity, they're federal agents. So they're federal agents, you can't sue them in tort, in state court, because you otherwise, uh, you, you know, you've heard of McCullough versus Maryland. That's the answer. It's right. not personal jurisdiction, uh, but you have to raise immunity as a, as, a, as a defense. You have to say, my client's a federal agent, and uh, we thumb our nose at uh, those state tort laws. <laughs> if you want to have a tort remedy, you have to sue the United States under the FTCA, and you didn't do it in this case, too bad for you. That, mm -hmm. that, that's what you need to say. Personal jurisdiction, it's a makeshift. I mean, read your brief. It, 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 it's, it's a clue. <laughs> anyway, we'll hear from United Airlines. Thank you, Your Honor. Is that, that's the other, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, according to the court's uh, clock, it's now good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Richard Grotch, and I'm here on behalf of the defendants uh, whose names have not been mentioned yet, and uh, that suits me fine, United Airlines UAL Corporation and Customer Service Supervisor David Nevins. Uh, in this instance, United Airlines is alleged to have done three things. One, 
asked for and received uh, Ms. Ibrahim's ticket, or pr probably more uh, accurately, her identification. Typed in the computer to ch begin checking her in, see a um, note of concern, pick up the phone, and call local law enforcement, just as federal law requires that customer service supervisor to do. Uh, Is there anything else? Anything else that United did? That you need to say? I, I don't believe so. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give you some rebuttal time. We'll give you a couple of minutes anyway. Uh, I, I'd just like to address a few points that were made by Mr. Bondanella's uh, counsel. Um, first of all, with respect to this distinction between a detention and an arrest, um, that distinction is something that would have to be developed under discovery. The, the, the term that was used in the police report is that um, they were asked to detain Ms. Ibrahim. The end result is that she was arrested. And so what Mr. Was Bondanel she, was did- she, Was she booked? She was booked. She was handcuffed. She was taken to the uh, was she, local Was she, was she jail. fingerprinted? I, I don't know the details of that, Does Your Does she Honor. have a picture with, with a number, holding a number? She was taken to a holding cell in the uh, uh, I, I jail that's within the airport. Closely. And what happened is they detained her. Uh, and I mean, it's, it, 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 it's an uncomfortable and difficult situation, mm -hmm. but I presume that the way some people get their name on the no-fly list is that they are known terrorists. So what's wrong with Mr. Uh, Bandanella saying, look, she is on this list, wrongly you tell us, and I, I don't dispute that, but he doesn't know that. She's on the list, so she could be a terrorist, so hold on to her until you had a chance to check her out with the FBI, which they do. They hold her for a couple of hours. I mean, it's, it's unpleasant, but, but is, it, is, it, is it illegal? It's not, and because the security directives do not authorize that someone who is on the no fly list can be arrested. They only say that they cannot fly, and the federal government conceded that. So Mr. Bondanella's direction that she be detained or arrested falls outside of the terms of the security directives, which means they fall outside of what he was supposed to be doing and, and violate her Fourth Amendment rights against search, uh, unreasonable search and seizure. However. That isn't the only question you have to draw. You also have some other uh, tests that you have to meet. What interest does California have in this? Ibrahim is not here. She really resides in Malaysia. We've got the, ca the agent in Virginia. Why does California have any interest here? California? Why, why is it that, I mean, you're going to have to go back to Virginia and D.C. for some of your actions anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, the important witnesses that might have to do with this particular situation would be back there, so effective resolution would go back there. What, uh, the only thing you've got going here in California is some uh, police officers which could easily be de brought back there, but if you're going to get to the bottom of the thing, uh, there is an existence of an alternative forum. The, uh, there is an efficient resolution that can happen. The interest in California is not big. Let's let it go to Virginia. Go back there and get it done. Well, if I may answer that, um, there are a number of questions being posed here. First of all, California has an interest because California uh, would want to prevent, uh, set some precedents to prevent this from happening to other passengers who are who might find their names on the no-fly no-fly list and Why who might is that also find. for California than Virginia? Well, and as far as filing suit in Virginia, we would not have personal jurisdiction over the San Francisco defendants in Virginia. The events which led to this lawsuit, namely her being arrested at San Francisco Airport, happened in California. If we file suit against Mr. Bondanella in Virginia, we'd have to have a separate lawsuit against the um, San Francisco defendants in California, risking in inconsistent judgments because both parties are going to point the fingers at each other. Um, so, and, and possibly leaving her without a remedy because both courts might find that the other party was um, substantially responsible. Um, so that's the problem with having to file suit in Virginia. And, and as far as the um, 
the burden on Mr. Bondanella. You know, Mr. Bondanella was working for the USIS. Um, he was a, a private contractor for working for his employer. His employer is likely indemnifying him. He's being represented by the same counsel that's also representing USIS. And so I, I don't think the burden is, is substantial. Um, and I, I think I'm going to rest on that, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, counsel. Case is arguable. Stand submitted. We are adjourned. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco has not ruled on this case. You're watching C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Mildred Loving, a black woman whose landmark Supreme Court case made interracial marriage legal, died last week. Next, we talk with Washington Post writer Patricia Sullivan on the Loving case and how it changed America. On the phone with us is Washington Post staff writer Pat Sullivan, who wrote the front page article on the May 1st death of Mildred Loving. Who was she?